Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the East Side Freedom Library and our program in collaboration with the Ramsey County Historical Society, History Revealed. I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director here of the Eastside Freedom Library. And it's my pleasure tonight uh, to be presenting Professor Martha Jones from Johns Hopkins University, who will be discussing with me her new book, a book that's actually um, going to be published next month in September, called Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Right to Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. Um, the Eastside Freedom Library's goal, our mission, is to inspire solidarity, work for justice, and advocate for equity for all. We're delighted to be partnering with the Ramsey County Historical Society uh, and have been working with them for a year now in these monthly programs called History Revealed. Although we can't present programs in person right now, we're pleased to be able to present tonight's program and more upcoming programs in collaboration with RCHS. The mission of the Ramsey County Historical Society is to preserve our past, inform our present, and inspire our future through publishing a quarterly magazine and award-winning books, presenting programs such as this in History Revealed, and providing education about Dakota lifeways and the traditions of the earlier settlers to school children and families through the Gibbs Farm Historic Site. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community and is actively engaged in issues of equity and inclusion. We will be collaborating together in an upcoming online exhibit on women's suffrage in Minnesota entitled Persistence continuing the struggle for suffrage and equality, 1848 to 2020. Please watch for more information on this program. Please consider supporting both the Eastside Freedom Library and the Ramsey County Historical Society. Our organizations rely on the support of those who use and value our programs. You can visit both organizations' websites to learn more about how you can become more involved. Again, uh, we're delighted to present this program this evening with Professor Martha Jones. Stay tuned to learn more about her and her work in the book Vanguard. Um, you can also stay tuned after the program to type in through the comment function on the Facebook and YouTube pages any comments or questions you might have. Professor Jones will be available to respond to your questions um, by typing responses to you. Thank you so much for your interest. We hope you enjoy the program. So here we are uh, with Martha Jones, author of the book that will come out next month, uh, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, um, Fought for the Right to Vote, and Inspired or Insisted on Equality for All. Um, Professor Jones teaches at Johns Hopkins University where she is uh, the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and a professor of history. Um, we last spoke about her book uh, two years ago, uh, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. Um, that book has won multiple prizes um, and has had a wide readership, not just in college classrooms and in the academy, but out there in the world where people are fighting for rights for people of color, rights for immigrants. Um, Professor Jones is really a public intellectual in the best sense uh, of the term. And uh, we're delighted that her new book is coming out just at a time when the Women's Suffrage Amendment is being celebrated uh, for its 100th anniversary. And it's a great opportunity uh, to talk about um, what that meant uh, to women of color um, and uh, how women of color fought before this amendment for a place in public discourse and public power and how they continued to fight after uh, this amendment was passed. 
So uh, good evening, Professor Jones. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, so uh, I wanted to start with something that struck me in the, my reading of, of your book, that there was a very interesting parallel, I thought, um, between your work as a historian, um, and that is drawing on the work of generations, both of historians and of people who may, we might call them historians without credentials, uh, people who were active in movements, uh, people who wrote their own memoirs. Um, there is certainly original scholarly research in your book, but there's also the pulling on a great deal of prior work that's been done. And I think one of the services of your book is to make us aware that what we might often refer to as untold stories mm. uh, have in fact been told and maybe the right people haven't been listening or knowing how to listen. So there's that element that your work rests on a very significant body of material. And secondly, um, that the fight of African-American women for not only the right to vote, uh, but for a voice, for power uh, within their community and within the larger society, that that too has built generation by generation. Um, women have built foundations, if I can beat a metaphor to death, uh, they've built foundations and floors. Um, and the fight for the women's suffrage amendment is merely one floor in that edifice. Um, and your book makes us aware of how struggles of generations never, I'm a romantic and a utopian to some degree, we never reach the ultimate goals that we're striving for, yet resources and accomplishments are made that pass on to the next generation. Um, so those two things struck me as a very interesting parallel in, in your book, Vanguard. Um, would you like to say a little bit about the scholarship that you discovered um, and relied on in building this book? Thank you, um, first of all, for having me. Um, and it's a pleasure to be back, um, even if we're back virtually. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and I appreciate uh, you drawing the parallel that um, you describe, because I think it's really an apt one. Mm -hmm. um, it was very important for me um, at the outset in this book to, um, if you will, make visible what I often describe as the three generations of Black women's historians um, who have um, long been at the work of recovering um, the history of Black women's politics, their struggles around power, and including the struggle for voting rights. Um, this work was pioneered by Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn, who was for many years a scholar um, here in Maryland at Morgan State University, whose doctoral dissertation mm -hmm. and later uh, monograph really um, deliberately challenged the hegemony of the uh, multi-volume history of women's suffrage that had been um, uh, uh, edited by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan Anthony and others, um, that those thousands of pages, as Dr. Turborg Penn uh, was able to uh, expose, had um, elided and erased and uh, otherwise um, set Black women at the margins of the story of American women's struggle for voting rights. And so um, if we take that as one important starting place, um, I then come as part of a second generation mm -hmm. and now there is a, a, yet another generation, but you're right that um, one of the things that was important to me in this anniversary year um, was to do my part to ensure that that academic scholarship, which is important and um, is, has its own force and 
um, our uh, historical understanding. Um, I really wanted to be sure um, that you couldn't miss it, if you will. Um, and to see now, I, I, it's not all in this book and, and, mm -hmm. and folks will, I hope, take a peek at the footnotes to appreciate how much more reading there is to do on this subject. Um, but there's no question that this book is, in a sense, a testament. You know, it, 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 is, it honors the three generations of historians who have um, been doing this work. Um, and at the same time, your second point mm -hmm. um, really poses a question about what we feel, uh, what we understand the, the field of African American women's history to be, mm. right? So you use the phrase historians about without credentials. I like that. Um, but I would go further even to mm -hmm. say that ours is a field that has grown up and out of uh, many kinds of Black women's writing yeah. um, and um, has never uh, been... Um, uh, gatekeeping in the sense that um, we only read historians or other people who appear to be like historians, that um, literature and memoir, um, chronicles, collective biographies, treatises, and more um, are all part of the tradition of Black women's history, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and as a consequence, um, perhaps rather than two parallel mm. tracts they are really part of the same mm. um, they are part of the same intellectual project um, mm -hmm. so I'm very indebted for example to a woman named Hallie Quinn Brown who in 1926 uh, publishes a book called Home Spun Heroines and Other Women of Distinction. And it's a collective biography that looks back over a century of African American women's lives, yes, but their ideas and their activism. And Ali Quinn Brown leaves for us, if you will, a trail um, that historians like me and many others have worked to follow. Um, but it's fair to say because archives that honored and preserved black women's history were so rare, um, it was up to black women to build their own archive. And mm -hmm. so we returned to the archives that they bequeathed to us again and again, um, as again, part of a shared project, um, rather than somehow black women's historians of the conventional sort in the 21st century simply looking back and plumbing those things. I consider somebody like Hallie Quinn Brown, who was an educator, an elocutionist, a club movement leader, um, as well as the editor of this book. Um, I consider her a fellow traveler in the project of Black women's history. Um, I have a different set of tools and a different set of conventions, without a doubt. Um, but I think we share a sense of the necessity of making that record and making it visible with the tools that we have. Great. Um, I was reminded in uh, your discussion of her, and I want to come back to her in a bit, but um, that we have to thank Henry Louis Gates Jr. for collecting and getting published this series of memoirs. And it, it must have been in the 70s uh, that, that Gates got these books published. Yeah, I think it's the 1980s. But, 80s? You're, I, I, but you're absolutely right. Professor Gates, in collaboration with um, New York City's Schomburg Center, mm -hmm. um, goes back to um, the literature, the prose, um, the commentary of Black women in the early Amer in early America, and republishes things, um, some of which had never been reprinted, um, others of which had been reprinted in the 70s and 60s by Arno Press. Uh -huh. um, and so there is a story about publishing and the roles that um, sort of uh, post-World War II publishers play in getting these materials um, back in print and available to us. I, I'd also point to the website um, documenting the South, documenting the American South, that has digitized many of these books. It's mm -hmm. one of the places that I first encountered many of them. So this is absolutely um, essential, even in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, if things aren't published, if they aren't on the library shelf, if they right. haven't been made digital, digitally available, but also 
free and open access available, um, we might not know that they um, exist. So sometimes I like to say, you know, the days are over uh, when we can say, oh, I had no idea. Yeah. Um, it's more like, well, maybe you didn't ask the question because if you ask the question of your librarian, um, you know, your local librarian, they would be able to point you to some very rich resources um, that are absolutely essential to me in the writing of Vanguard and are illuminating and exciting because we hear mm -hmm. these women again in their own voices. Yeah. So I want to ask a question about a different kind of archive. And, and that is, I was just breathless reading the first part of your book about your own family, about the, the generations of women, your great grandmother, your grandmother, your mother, how, and how you managed to gather their stories. And, um, and one of the things that we try to emphasize here at the Eastside Freedom Library is the richness of stories that are kept alive within families and how important it is that we bring those stories out into the public eye and ear. So um, could you say a little bit about how these stories within your own family came to you? They partly come because I uh, work in my home office with uh, portraits, photographs mm -hmm. of my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, my great great grandmother on the wall. These are um, some of the uh, women to whom I feel accountable as I write my histories. Um, but as I was finishing, I became deeply self-conscious. Uh, I realized I didn't know their stories mm -hmm. um, and um, they have passed and so I realized they had never told me the stories of uh -huh. their experience of the 19th Amendment. Um, and here, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and my great-great-grandmother all, are all living still in 1920. And so um, what is a historian to do um, expect, except to head to the archives and mm -hmm. begin to try and piece that together? Um, and there are two um, lessons from that, right? One um that there are things i couldn't know um and is a story i think it is a facet of the story of the intersection of the 19th amendment and of jim crow um mm. that uh, perhaps not surprisingly state officials do not um keep uh copious um and exhaustive records of um, the disfranchisement of Black Americans in 1920 and in the years that follow. So I spent time at the North Carolina State Archives where the voting uh, records become very thin um, in, by 1920. Um, and I finished my day there looking for my grandmother and ending um, more than disappointed mm. because I recognize that part of the legacy of Jim Crow in a sense, is the erasure, right? Mm -hmm. Is the, the disposal of those records um, to the degree that they once existed. And I'm not gonna be able to tell that part of her story. On the other hand, um, I'm aided um, particularly by African-American newspapers, um, mm -hmm. which dutifully chronicle black women's mm -hmm. emergence onto the political sphere. I'm aided by, you know, democratic, Southern democratic newspapers that fear the prospect of black women at the polls and also chronicle uh, black women's activism, not because they celebrate it, but because they're looking to fuel the suppression of black women's votes. Um, and at the end, I fortunately um, come upon an interview that my own grandmother gave to historian Bill Chafe hmm. um, back in the 1970s when uh, Professor Chafe was writing his history of um, the civil rights movement through the city of Greensboro, North Carolina, where my grandmother lived. Hmm. And there she was. Hmm. Um, but interestingly, she wasn't talking about 1920 at all. She was talking about the 1960s and the road to the Voting Rights Act. And this was the insight that came from trying to tell her story, that if I focus too much or too exclusively on 1920, 
I was missing that for African American women, the story of voting rights, women's voting rights, as well as men's, requires that we come certainly all the way to 1965 and the passage of the Voting Rights Act. My grandmother is in Greensboro in the 1950s and 1960s as young people, students in that city are not only sitting in at Woolworths, they are also running voter registration campaigns. And she is a mentor and friend to those young people. And as she says, it is thrilling. Um, and you realize that's her voting rights story. And mm -hmm. so my book needed to come well beyond right that important landmark which is the 19th amendment if i wanted to tell black women's history i was going to have to come all the way to 1965. so that's great for me to hear that when we're able to engage those kinds of stories they don't only add information uh, to what we have but they also add frameworks and perspectives to what we're looking at. And, and I think you show a great talent to incorporate those perspectives as you're building your own narrative. Um, can we go back before the amendment? Because you don't start the book uh, with, the, with the fight for the 19th amendment either. You start the book with abolitionism um, in the 1820s and 30s. So, why did you decide to start the book where you started it? I was looking for the roots, if you will, of black women's um, political critique. And the core of that political critique, one that extends until our own time, mm -hmm. is the view that neither racism nor sexism should have any bearing on American political culture, political mm -hmm. rights, and political power. Mm -hmm. So today we refer to that oftentimes as intersectionality. Mm -hmm. That's an important um, analytic framework yeah. uh, given to us by um, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw in the 1980s. Um, but I wanted to understand the roots of that critique and where it had come from. And it turns out by the 18 teens and 20s, black women, yes, abolitionists, but black women preachers, mm. um, black women um, uh, literary society organizers are all speaking precisely in these terms. Mm -hmm. So in order to understand that potent and um, so in some ways such a timely critique um, required me to go back 200 years and discover some very singular black women mm -hmm. um, in many cases um, who really are stepping to the pulpit, stepping to the podium, and first of, and foremost, offering us a set of ideas. Yes, they are activists, but they are offering us an analytic framework mm -hmm. that will be inherited across generations. As I say in the book, this is the high bar that black women set 200 years ago. Um, and we could talk about how long it takes for the nation to catch up and to um, embrace those values. But black women are speaking those values going back to the earliest decades of the 19th century. It's great. And, you know, along with intersectionality, even the, the inside of the second wave women's movement that the public and private spheres are totally overlapping and influencing each other. And so these black women that you write about, whether they are organizing in clubs, whether they're organizing in churches, um, or whether they're organizing for overt political issues like the abolition of slavery, um, are interweaving the public and private spheres of their lives all the time. But this is essential that um, this, um, We've always known this, or we've known this for a long time through important work um, on African American women in labor, right? Mm -hmm. The way in which there really is no public private 
divide that is mm -hmm. said to somehow characterize the um, the story of American women's history across time. Um, but it turns out in politics also, um, whether it is the ways in which politics is being spoken of and developed and passed along within families, um, or it is the ways in which um, Black women are using um, intimate relations to then build political organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I write a lot about uh, um, the naming um, and the ways in which naming um, of children, of political organizations, of schools, um, that is a way of, in fact, passing along politics. If anybody's ever been to a Phyllis Wheatley Library or a Sojourner Truth High School or an Ida B. Wells um, Park, um, this is not simply an honorific or a monument. This is a political practice for black women that treats the very names as a political act. Um, Mary mm. Church Terrell, the great early 19th century black suffragist, names her daughter Phyllis for mm. Phyllis Wheatley. Um, today in the 21st century, um, Representative Ayanna Presley um, has named her cat Sojo, and that is short for Sojourner Truth. And it makes us chuckle, but it is a serious intervention, which is mm -hmm. to say um, that even in those intimate gestures, Black women are engaged in political work. Um, here in the Twin Cities, um, in the 1930s, there were two African American men union organizers. Maceo Finney was an organizer of sleeping car porters, and Maceo Littlejohn was an organizer of dining car waiters. Both of them were born in 1899. In 1898, the St. Paul Black community had celebrated the Cuban Revolution, the hero of which was Antonio Maceo. Absolutely. Um, I suspect that their mothers had some voice in the names that these these babies were given. And, and I just love the idea that people might grow up to embody what's in the name uh, that they've been given. Um, that, what's that say? Making a way out of no way. Um, that whatever resources can be grabbed uh, can be mobilized. Absolutely, um, and, and who hasn't been asked, you know, who are you named for? Where does your name come from? And it is this right entree right into a history lesson. Absolutely, um, and it's a powerful one. Absolutely. So, staying with the the theme of names for a moment, uh, one of the things that delighted me in your book was your discussion of Hallie Quinn Brown, um, and the fact that here in St. Paul we have a Hallie Q. Brown Community Center. Um, most people, including me, know very little about who Hallie Q. Brown was and what she did. Many of us in the last two months have gotten involved in issues about statues and, and monuments. Um, and I discovered in reading your book uh, that Hallie Q. Brown played a central role in organizing against the building of a particular statue in Washington, D.C. in 1922. W would you tell us a little bit about that, please? Sure. So Hallie Quinn Brown, as we've mentioned, the, the educator, elocutionist, club movement leader, um, author, um, is at the helm of the National Association of Colored Women in 1920 when the 19th Amendment is ratified. She is charged, if you will, of leading the largest organization, political organization of African American women in the country into this new struggle for voting rights, this challenge to Jim Crow that is going to keep too many Black women from the polls. Hallie Quinn Brown certainly works directly on the question of suffrage for Black women immediately following the amendment's uh, uh, ratification. And at the same time, the story of the so-called Mammy Monument mm. that was proposed by the United Daughters of the Confederacy to be placed on the mall in Washington demonstrates to us the ways in which 
black women's politics required a multi-prong, multifaceted, um, uh, extraordinary uh, range of challenges. Uh, black women could never be single issue uh, political leaders. And, and this story illustrates that. So the United Daughters of the Confederacy um, in an era when uh, monument making is um, sort of taking hold is an extension of uh, pro uh, uh, propelling the myth of the lost cause forward, the um, UDC proposes to um, erect a monument to the, um, the mammy, mammies of the South. Uh, mammy being a um, pejorative term for um, enslaved women and formerly enslaved women. And the monument is proposed to be quite literally um, a, some mythical reproduction of a black woman in the stereotypical image of the mammy. And Hallie Quinn Brown, um, leading the National Association of Colored Women, um, is charged um, along with other leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois um, at the NAACP um, with defeating this. Um, I love the story because she gauge, engages in a bit of subterfuge. She gets herself appointed as secretary behind the scenes so she can know some of what's going on. Um, but she is also, um, her words in this period are, um, memorable because she makes plain um, that this monument is no tribute to black women. This monument is an instantiation of a pernicious myth, right? The myth not only of the fact of enslaved women, that is a fact, but the myth that black women were content, that they were loyal to white families, that they were passive. Um, this is what Hallie Quinn Brown is objecting to, and she, certainly objecting to it because it's proposed to sit in the middle of Washington in a most prominent place. And what she says is not only does she expose, right, the, the fallacy of the myth, um, she says if the women of the UTC want to pay tribute to formerly enslaved women, they could exert, in, exert influence over the men in their households and get them to enact anti-lynching legislation, um, fair housing legislation, et cetera, right? Hallie Quinn Brown says there are plenty of um, tributes to be paid, right, to formerly enslaved women and their descendants. Um, but to, to promote a myth is not it. Um, the tribute um, in particular, right, is the um, seeing through of the long quest for anti-lynching legislation. And while that quest continues until today, um, the monument loses its political hot air, if you will, um, and is not installed, even as we know many other monuments in this period will in fact go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really emphasized for me the degree to which political struggle operates on a symbolic level as well as on a real level. Um, and that these representations really matter. Um, I noticed this last week and I'm, I don't remember the name of the scholar, but someone has just published a book with NYU Press called The Content of Our Caricature. Mm. Um, and it's, it's high time that we bring more critical thinking to the power of these images. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. That might be Rebecca Wanzo. At, yes, it is. Yes, That's exactly. She, she, yes. Wonderful. Yeah, Rebecca Wanzo at um, Wash U in St. Louis. Uh-huh. Great, great. Um, so I, I wonder, I know as a fellow historian that it takes years to write a book and that we never know, like, what time is it? when the book comes out. We, we, we can't anticipate how a book is gonna to speak to its moment. Your book seems to be in tremendous conversation with the moment in, in which we're living. And, and I wonder, you know, if you were to have the opportunity to write a new introduction to the book, situating it in the summer of 2020, what would you say uh, that the conversation is that this book is having? 
Oh, that's such a great question um, because, of course, you're right. Um, I knew we would be in the year of the uh, anniversary of the 19th Amendment, but I did not know where we would be um, politically. And I certainly did not understand um, the degree to which the experience, the scourge of voter suppression with mm -hmm. which we live today um, is an essential framing for the book that I've written. Yes. It is a history of voter suppression, um, certainly um, that is vividly recounted in the moment after the 19th Amendment is ratified and still too many black women cannot get to the polls. Um, but it is a longer story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because the women I write about are very tied to their fathers and their sons, their brothers, um, their husbands who have been disenfranchised, who are facing voter suppression um, in the wake of um, Reconstruction's um, demise. Uh, they even remember um, the struggles from the early 19th century um, in, in many places in the U.S., including New York and Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. where free African-Americans lose the right to vote mm -hmm. before the Civil War. Um, so I think that um, I might use the word voter suppression um, because I think there is that. Um, and it is a reminder, frankly, that uh, there really is no golden age of voting rights. Yeah in US history, mm -hmm. um, as close as we get might be the years between 1965 and 2013 when the Voting Rights Act is in full effect. But even the Voting Rights Act and the litigation that it uh, demand, the enforcement that it generates, reminds us that even in the golden age, voting rights are hard won and are a struggle. I'm somebody who doesn't quite say it in the introduction, but I think I would. I'm somebody who doesn't like the term suffrage. Uh -huh. First of all, I think young people don't know, you know, in, in, in any commonsensical way what on earth suffrage refers to. But beyond that, I think that women's suffrage as a phrase and women's suffrage as a movement has served to exceptionalize this particular struggle from voting rights from all others. It has distanced it from mm -hmm. the black American struggle, for example, for mm -hmm. voting rights in ways that I think are pernicious and have led mm -hmm. to the um, uh, invisibility of black women in that story. Um, so I very purposefully in the book only use the term suffrage in the chapter that is mm -hmm. focused on the 19th Amendment and otherwise use the term voting rights. I think I would say more about that today um, mm -hmm. because I think there's a way still in which there's a misunderstanding that somehow mm -hmm. this story of the road to the 19th Amendment is a special one. Uh -huh. Of course, it has its unique facets and features, mm -hmm. um, but there are too many American women who don't vote after the 19th Amendment, and that is certainly a story about voter suppression and the mm -hmm. struggle for voting rights. Mm -hmm. So I think is the, the last area that I just want to explore with you is, is this final phrase in your title, um, that, that Black women insisted on equality for all. Um, and we're living in a moment here in the summer of 2020 when a very important part of political discourse is the idea that uh, white allies, accomplices, collaborators, whatever noun we might choose to use, that this is an important time for us to listen to the leadership voices of people of color and quite particularly African Americans and perhaps even more the kind of African American women who founded Black Lives Matter and, and have been generating leadership at a grassroots level. So what do you think that message is about communicating, insisting on equality for all? You know, as a historian, um, we, we pay careful attention to words and the words that the people we write about use. Yeah. Um, and one of the words that I had not expected to encounter again and again and again was the word humanity. 
the women I write about, when they speak about mm. their objectives, their goals, um, their concerns, their interests, again and again, they invoke this capacious term, humanity. Um, yes, they're interested in their, speak for their families, for their communities, for Black Americans, but ultimately they all come back to this extraordinary mm. um, vision, um, which is we seek political power for ourselves to benefit, to better the world for all of humanity. Mm. And this to me really um, pushes back against the notion that there's some kind of crude um, identity politics yes. at play here, mm -hmm. um, that, that black women's politics is self-serving. Mm -hmm. um, to the contrary, right? Yes, black women draw from their own experiences, mm -hmm. their politics, their philosophy, uh, their strategies and their tactics emerge out of their own experience, about out of their own material world in many ways. But when they then begin to speak about where they're headed, where they are going, what they will tell you across two centuries is humanity. I like to invoke the example of someone like Stacey Abrams, mm -hmm. just to remind us that when space, Stacey Abrams advocates for access to the polls, to voting rights in 2020, she's not advocating for black women's access to the polls. So she certainly is, mm -hmm. right? She's speaking to all Georgians and all Americans. Mm -hmm. And this to me um, is one of the principles that black women bring, right? Which is not to fall victim in your political vision to the kinds of divisions um, that otherwise have long served, right, mm -hmm. to undercut um, the best of progressive and radical causes in the United States. That is true for Black women in the 19th century, and I would say it remains true um, today. And that is, again, a high bar for the rest of us, right, who have come of age and have um, been active politically in scenes that are terribly fraught, um, but to your point, when I began to listen to the women in this mm -hmm. story and what they were telling me, it was not a story about their political power for power's sake. It mm -hmm. was about having this much broader vision that encompasses us all. Now that is a tough, right? That, you know, that is a tough challenge. Uh, right. So I don't mean to offer that up blithely. Mm -hmm. um, and still, I think the women in my book might say, gosh, if, if you'd gotten on board with us 150 years ago, we might be a very different nation um, if we had been able to see the interests of humanity as a whole, right? Francis Ellen Watkins Harper in 1866, we are all bound up in one great bundle of humanity. And if the coronavirus hasn't taught us anything and has taught us what it means to be bound up as one great bundle of humanity, um, and yet our political vision, our political ambition oftentimes doesn't go that distance. Right. And I think Black women have insisted for a very long time that it should. Thank you. That's a great note for us to end on, to think about how these generations of Black women have set a high bar uh, for all of us in our aspirations. Um, thank you, Professor Martha Jones. Uh, again, uh, her book, which will be out in early September from Basic Books, uh, Vanguard, how Black Women Broke Barriers, Gained the Right to Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. Um, it's great to see you and talk with you. Um, if you're watching and uh, want to type in some questions uh, when the interview is over, we'll, we'll try to respond to questions or comments you might send in. Um, think of the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, thank you all. Great. Thank you.